This lesson is about electric fields. Let's start off with a couple of examples. Here's an object with a net positive charge. Let's imagine that we bring another charged object nearby. And let's also imagine that this object is also positively charged. If we place the second charge above, it would feel a force upward. If we placed it below, it would feel a force downward. If we placed it on the right, it would feel a force to the right. If we placed it on the left, it would feel a force to the left. And any other place that we put the second object, it will feel a force away from the large object in the center. This leaves us with an electric field diagram that looks like this. I suggest sketching that in your notes. One more example. Here's a negative object. And again, I want us to imagine that we're going to bring a second charged object nearby, and like before, we're going to imagine that it's a positive charge. If we put a positive charge below this, it'll feel a force up. If we put it above, it'll feel a force down. If we put it on the left, it'll feel a force to the right. If we put it on the right, it'll feel a force to the left. Any place we put this positive charge, it will feel a force toward our negative object. This leaves us with an electric field map that looks like this. An electric field is an area in which a charged particle will feel an electrostatic force due to the presence of another charged particle. Like we just did, we map electric fields with electric field lines. And as you saw, they're actually arrows. Electric field lines are based on the direction in which a positive test charge would feel force. That's exactly what we just did in our previous two examples. Why are electric fields based on a positive test charge? Well, because. Seriously, that's the only answer I can give you. It is a convention in physics. Someone in the 1800s decided that we would base them off of a positive test charge. They could have just as easily decided that they would be based off of a negative test charge, but they didn't. Anyway, moving on. Here's a more complicated electric field. No matter where we place the positive test charge, the positive test charge is going to feel two forces. It's going to feel an attractive force to the negative object, and it's going to feel a repulsive force from the positive object. I want to go through this a little bit quickly to save time. I'm going to show the placement of the positive test charge. I'm going to show you the force that it would feel from each of those two charged objects that you see now. And then I will show the resultant of those two forces. Once we have the resultant force on the positive test charge at a variety of locations, we'll be able to map the electric field. If we place it right in the middle, it feels an attraction to the left and a repulsion to the left. If we place it on the right, it feels a repulsion to the right and an attraction to the left. If we place it on the left, it feels a repulsion to the left and an attraction to the right. That's the basic idea. We could do many, many more of these, but it's not really worth our time. I think with these few data points, we can figure out the basic map of this electric field. It looks something like this. What if we had two positive objects? Well, right in the middle, the positive test charge would feel a repulsion in both directions, and they would be the same magnitude, so they would cancel each other out. There's essentially no electric field right there in the middle. But at any other place, there will be a net force. Again, we could look at many more points, but this is enough to get the basic idea of this electric field. If we change the two objects to both be negative, the shape of the electric field map is not really going to change. What will definitely change is the direction that the arrows are pointing. Since electric fields are always based off of a positive test charge, 
The arrows should point away from positive charges, but they should point toward negative charges. Here are a couple statements we could make to summarize what we've learned about electric fields. Field lines always point away from positive charges, and field lines always point toward negative charges. Finally, and this may not have been obvious from our diagrams, field lines do not cross each other. That was the qualitative part of electric fields, and now on to the quantitative part. Let's include some numbers. Different electric fields can have different strengths, and even within an electric field, different points can have different strengths. The electric field strength is a ratio of the force exerted on a particle in the field and the charge of the particle. Written as an equation, we have E equals Fe over Q, where E stands for electric field strength. This is often described as electric field intensity. Fe, as you know, is the electrostatic force, and Q is the charge. Let's take a look at an example. When placed in an electric field, a small metal sphere with a charge of positive 6.3 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs experiences a force of 5.67 times 10 to the negative 5 newtons. What is the strength of the electric field? As always, we start with the equation. We can plug in our force and our charge, and we can find that the electric field strength is 9 newtons per coulomb. There's no special unit for this, it's just newtons per coulomb. Here's another example. How much force will be exerted on a particle with a charge of negative 8.7 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs if it is placed in an electric field with a strength of 2.6 newtons per coulomb? There's one more thing we need to talk about that's related to electric fields. So as we've seen, a charged object in an electric field feels a force. Either the force of the electric field or an external force can cause the charged object to move. Right? If it's moving, that means it has a displacement. So for example, here we have a positive charge, and you can see the electric field around it. And if we put another positive charge at point A, the electric field itself would exert a force in that direction. If the particle at point A was free to move, it could have a displacement and end up at point B. Similarly, if the object were at point B, someone or something could exert a force on it toward point A, causing it to have a displacement. In either of these cases, we have the object feeling a force and having a displacement. This means that work is done. This brings us to the concept of potential difference. The amount of work required to move a charged object depends on two things. It depends on the magnitude of the charge itself, because that will affect the amount of force it feels. And it depends on what we call the potential difference between the two locations. This is kind of like height for gravitational potential energy. If you want to figure out how much gravitational potential energy an object gains, you need to know the mass of the object, and you have to know the height that it's gaining or losing. The equation for the work done on an object in an electric field, then, is W equals V times Q, where W stands for work, V stands for potential difference. We use V because this is also called voltage. More on that later. And Q, of course, stands for charge. On your reference table, it's actually written as V equals W over Q. Let's take a brief look at the units. If we plugged in an amount of work and an amount of charge, we would plug in joules over coulombs, and we would get joules per coulomb. And that's perfectly appropriate. This, however, has a special name. A joule per coulomb is called a volt. You've definitely heard about volts before. Here's an example. In order to move an object with a positive 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 coulomb charge between two points in an electric field, 5.4 times 10 to the negative 6 joules of work must be done. 
what is the potential difference between these points? Well, V equals W over Q. We can plug in the work done and the charge of the particle. And we can find that the potential difference between these points is three joules per coulomb, otherwise known as three volts. Here's another example. A charged particle is moved between two points in an electric field with a potential difference of 1.5 volts. Moving the particle required 7.05 times 10 to the negative 3 joules of work. What is the magnitude of the charge of the particle? 